to all adoptable dogs and cats. And we've passed this in seven states now. Maryland just passed last Tuesday. And um, <laughs> kind of what brings me more uh, here is my undercover work. I spoke on that yesterday, and uh, I worked on exotic animal issues, including elephants, with Animal Defenders International, and then uh, before that, in defense of animals. Hi, I'm Dee Gaug. Is that a good volume? Um, I'm from Safe Nosy Now. Uh, many of you are uh, obviously familiar with Nosy. She was. Don't be shy. Get right in there. She was the <laughs> proverbial poster child for captive elephants in circuses. Um, Safe Nosy Now. Essentially, our mission is to get captive elephants from circuses and zoos to sanctuary. Um, by way of background, I which I could stand up and tell you that I had 15 years of trial experience in animal law cases, but I don't. Um, and my experience uh, as a lawyer was in a completely different field. Um, buried my law degree for quite a while, raised my family, and then about a year and a half ago, I snuck in right before my 50th birthday, my number one on my bucket list trip to South Africa to see elephants in the wild, um, which I had always wanted to do. Uh, I came back, and you talk about pivotal moments in your life, that first elephant that I saw come out uh, of the brush changed me forever, changed the focus of my life um, forever. I came back and said I have to do something using my law degree uh, to benefit elephants uh, in the United States. Um, and I began reaching out to different organizations, long story short, um, realized that I didn't get the job I applied for as an elephant handler, <laughs> and I needed to do something um, more in my field, which was the law. Um, and that led me to a wonderful organization, uh, Save Nosy Now. And they, prior to um, last year, were essentially a, a Facebook group um, tra tracking Nosy all over the country. I don't know how much of her story you're all aware of, but um, she was everywhere, uh, and they had a tremendous amount of information, and there is a tremendous amount of information out there. Many, many organizations, wonderful organizations. I know Pete has done a lot of work on Nosy's case um, as well, as many others, ADI. Um, but we just started to do things kind of off the cuff and really put together what I like to refer to as a throw the mud against the wall campaign. Um, and. The rest is, is history. She was seized thanks to many, many efforts of many, many groups and is now, yeah. <laughs> I still get teary-eyed and it, it, it's kind of one of those things that I, I'll always remember where I was when I got that phone call. Standing in my kitchen, I almost dropped the phone. My hand was shaking that she was getting seized in Alabama. Um, but we're currently working um, onward and upward. We must keep going because there's plenty other captives who are currently working very hard on our OSHA campaign. Uh, OSHA's in the Natural Bridge Zoo in Virginia. Um, we're still doing a lot of things in the periphery uh, in Florida because there's a lot more to be done there. We've got such a plethora of captive elephants there. Um, but that's, that's essentially where we're at right now. Does this work? Oh, it does work. Yay. Hey, just okay. a quick interview. Let's hold the clapping just because of time. So oh, I want people yeah. to clap for me. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so because of that, I'm going to keep it really short. So Catherine Doyle, Director of Science Research and Advocacy with the Performing Animal Welfare Society. We have three <coughs> sanctuaries in California. And our largest is ARC 2000, where we care for eight elephants and big cats and bears. And our position is that no wild animal belongs in captivity. And, and we are captivity as well at the sanctuary. Sanctuary isn't the end all. These animals need to be protected where they live. So. Hi, I'm, I'm Rachel Matthews with the PETA Foundation. Um, I'm Associate Director of Captive Animal Law Enforcement there. And um, we're a team within the legal department that uh, has attorneys, veterinarians, captive wildlife specialists. Um, and we work to develop um, legal, regulatory, and policy um, campaigns in order to end um, the worst practices of, of captive exotic animals, and my focus is specifically on elephants um, and circuses. Hi, I'm Kirsten. Um, I, am, I am the co-founder of Elephant Guardians of Los Angeles, and we are uh, running the campaign to free Billy the Elephant from the Los Angeles Zoo. Yeah. Uh, thank you. 
and um, I'm also on the board of directors for the Carullo Center um, with Gay Bradshaw. Um, I'm working on the project with her to open the All Bull Elephant Sanctuary. And I'm also a special education teacher with LAUSD in my free time. Um, <laughs> uh, I have a really quick announcement. I asked Courtney if I could make this announcement, and I have her permission. We have started an international coalition to free Billy. Uh, we have a lot of signatories from all over the world. It's, it's a very simple statement, just urging the Los Angeles City Council to pass the motion that's currently before them, directing the zoo to release Billy to sanctuary, and also to end captive elephant breeding in Los Angeles. It's for organizations, not individuals. So if any of your organization, organizations are willing to sign on, you don't have to do anything. You just, your organization signs on, and we include your website, so maybe you'll get some exposure. So if you're interested in signing on, please talk to me. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ray Ryan. I'm a former elephant keeper at the Wild Island Park in San Diego. Uh, consider myself a sometime author. Uh, wrote a book called uh, Keepers of the Ark about my experience at the Wild Animal Park, and uh, was going to start writing another book about other stuff until I came here today, and now I'm going to get back writing about animals again. But uh, one announcement I wanted to make, which I keep forgetting to make, is that I'm from Chicago, and we're one of the big cities in the United States, and we do not have elephants in two zoos. And it took a lot of people, and they had elephants there when I grew up, until I got there, until after everybody went through a lot of stuff recently. And hopefully we will intend to never have them ever again. So we're working on it. So right now we don't have elephants in one of the biggest cities in the United States. So we're doing okay. All right. Is that everybody? Thank you so much. So I'll start with the first question, and um, we'll go from there. Um, so being that the USDA is useless, the, <laughs> the groundbreaking actions of Alabama seizing Nosy is key in setting a precedence for any community to do the same. Question. How can we press for more action like this? Um, can I take that? We can start with you, uh, uh, Dee, and then, me, yeah. Sure. Um, well, when you say take action like that, and what happened in Nosy's situation was kind of a perfect storm. Um, you know, we, the, the ACO, the animal control officer, saw something that we've all seen, but for some reason she decided to act upon it, contacted the district attorney who contacted the judge and got the writ of seizure. Um, I, I don't think that that exact scenario was going to happen uh, again anytime soon. It'd be nice to think that it, it would, but there are some things that you can do to um, enact change short of trying to do anything with the USDA because Yes, they pretty much are useless, um, and for some reason are not answering FOIA requests anymore. Um, so what we really did at Save Nosy Now is we really attack things at the state level, and I think we were pretty successful in doing that, um, and never set foot uh, in court. Um, we did things like we got his insurance policy, Campbell. when I say he, I mean uh, Hugo Libel. Um, and this was just simply by getting a, a copy of his renewal application in the state of Florida, which he was required to have uh, in order to exhibit her in Florida. Um, we found out who his insurance company was, um, and this kind of, I, I know we're on a time constraint, but this is something that everybody can do, and I'm not saying that this would be a great scenario for everybody or a uh, proper situation, but just to try to think out of the box, think beyond um, the USDA, yes, we have to do those things, yes, we have to file submissions, um, yes, we have to continue to make FOIA requests, and we have to lay groundwork for possible litigation somewhere down the line, but, um, you know, in the, in the immediate future, there's things that you can do. I, I was on an RV trip with my family, and I had the insurance company's phone number, and I said to my kids, pipe down in the back, I have to make a phone call, and I called. Um, and I found out who the insurance agent was and spoke to that person, took several phone calls, but all done in, a, in, in my car traveling. And I said, this is what's going on, and I'm sure that this is um, not in, um, you know, he's not comporting with what he, he agreed to in your, in your liability policy. And he basically sent me some information, and I did. And I emailed him everything, and within 24 hours, um, they issued a cancellation notice for his ins liability insurance. And just something very simple, something, you know, kind of off the cuff, out of the box. And I, I can't possibly give you guys a takeaway that the people on this panel can give because I don't have the, their experience. But I can tell you, you've got to think of things out of the box, maybe things that had n never been tried before. 
Um, and that was kind of the beginning of the end for Hugo, because now um, they, you know, subsequently his, you know, his, um, his license was denied uh, in the state of Florida. Um, and then he left the state of Florida and continued all last summer to travel with her uh, all through the fall. Um, but we were kind of hammering the zoning issue. Um, he lives in Polk County, Florida, which is about an hour and so away from my home. Um, and we, lo and behold, he wasn't zoned to keep an exotic animal. Um, so one of our other admins, who was excellent with those types of regulations, simply emailed over and over again, asked for a meeting, and sure enough, um, he was, Hugo was, I think it was the first letter, it went back and forth a few times. Um, ultimately, in February of this year, the, the final determination was made that he can never come back there uh, to that particular piece of property again um, in Polk County, Florida, which is where he's had his home for 30 years. Um, so there, there are a lot of things that you can do. You don't have to be a lawyer to do those things. You know, make calls. Know, know what your regulations are in your state. They differ from state to state. Some states don't have any regulations. They're just simply governed by the AWA, which sets the bar somewhere around here. Um, but, you know, in Florida they do. Um, in Virginia, our, our campaign now that we're in a coalition um, with uh, working with IDAs, uh, amongst others, um, we've got you know, the, the Bible I have is the permit regulations from the state of Virginia. And I'm looking, going methodically through every single one of the requirements in order to get a permit. And we're right now in the fishing expedition um, portion of our uh, campaign. Um, but we're starting to get our requests answered. And we're finding that, wow, they really don't have proof of insurance that the Natural Bridge Zoo has liability insurance. You know, little things like that. Um, all of that information came just shortly before I came to this conference, so we haven't really had a chance to decide what we're going to do with that type of information. But, um, you know, find out exactly what you have to do to have a permit. Um, if you're looking to, to shut down a roadside zoo or a traveling circus, what, what do they need? And I, I would bet you anything they haven't um, complied with everything they need to do. And I would further bet that the state agency who's supposed to be on top of that is not on top of it. Um, you really have to be a big pain in the ass. And I think, um, you know, that's probably what we did. We just hammered them with emails, the Florida Wildlife Commission over and over again with Nosy. And we're starting to do that now with um, DGIF, which is the Department of Game and Inland Fisheries in Virginia, which is where ASHA is, is housed. So just think beyond what's traditionally been done. Don't, don't give up on those things. It's all part of the whole picture. Um, you know, the USDA is not going away, unfortunately. Um, so we have to still do things the way they've always been done, but just try to think out of the box. Um, that would be my suggestion. That's great. Thank you. And before I open it up to other people, the next question actually is related, and it's directed to Rachel Road around this, so maybe we'll go there and then uh, we can open it up. But uh, in a previous panel, uh, Delcy of PETA emphasized that a multi-prong approach is necessary to help captive elephants in the U.S. Could Rachel of PETA describe how such an approach was utilized that ultimately led to the rescue of Nosy the Elephant from the libel circus. Also, how did the PETA attorneys collaborate uh, or help the county prosecute in that effort? Sure. So um, our PETA's multi-prong approach, um, Dee touched on some of the, the kinds of things that PETA worked on as well. Um, but we not only looked at um, permitting in every single town or county or city or state that Liebel went to um, and appealed to permitting authorities. Um, PETA wrote to every single venue where Nosy would turn up. Um, and, and for those of you who don't know that much about how Hugo Liebel operated, um, he didn't post a schedule. Um, and I, I mean, at some point he had a website and posted a schedule but uh, PETA made it a little too difficult for him to get business if he posted his schedule ahead of time. So we had to um, track Nosy down, essentially using eyewitnesses, um, and were able to build a huge network of people um, who would, at, Nosy just became recognizable. And that was through the, these grassroots groups that sprung up all over the country. Um, I, I don't know how many groups there are for Nosy. There's quite a few. Um, and so we had people on the ground documenting. Um, we had experts who went out and 
had a look at Nosy and inspected her and made recommendations. We met with officials, uh, we met with the FWC, we met with the USDA, um, not that that accomplished anything, but we needed to, you know, be, as, as Dee said, um, that doesn't mean, uh, the fact that the agency isn't responsive doesn't mean you need to shut up, um, quite the opposite. Um, we contacted every venue, we got permits denied. Um, one example of a success was there was a, a fair in Ohio called the Williams County Fair, um, and every year they brought Nosy back. And they, it was uh, a big media event for this little town in their local paper. Um, we would put out, a pre we put out a press release, I think, the first year and got lots of coverage, and it was favorable for Nosy. Um, but the town, the fair director, really dug his heels in. And every year, PETA would put an action alert on its website. People contacted the fair director um, and I think others in, who helped run the fair. And after three years, they finally said, quietly, um, the elephant's not coming back. <laughs> so it was, it's, uh, you know, it took three years, but that was one more venue down. Um, and so it just became harder and harder for them to get business for Nosy. She became more and more visible. And um, generally speaking, I find that animal control is not helpful because they don't know what they're looking at when they see an elephant. Um, they don't know how to move an elephant. If they, you know, nobody knows how to seize an elephant. <laughs> um, so generally speaking, we don't go to animal control. Um, with elephants just because they, an animal control officer will go out, um, they'll look at an elephant, they won't see any, anybody beating an elephant, for example, um, and they'll come away with a clean inspection. And then Liebel goes to the next town, or the exhibitor goes to the next town and says, look, you know, they saw us in the last town and they said we're fine. And then, you, so you don't want to get a stack of clean inspections from animal control officers who don't know what they're looking at because they don't have the training. Um, in terms of how um, PETA assisted in, in Alabama, um, that was a matter of education. Um, that the prosecutor um, in Alabama also did not, you know, she, she needed to be educated. She needed to know what was important about elephants. She needed to know what was important about um, Nosy in particular and about the labels. And so that was just a, a very, um, we had a very short amount of time to bring this person up to speed on elephants. And so that was, that was the role that, that PETA had. Um, we helped educate. Um, we also um, did, we publicized the case a lot. Um, that's an, another aspect of the multi-pronged approach that was discussed yesterday is media. Um, for a while there, every time Nosy would go to a new town, we'd put out a press release calling on them to the fair or whatever that was hosting her to, to not host her. Um, and that resulted in a lot of discussion and almost always favorable. I mean, it's really people, when people in rural Alabama drive up and see an elephant, now we're at the point where they think that's awful. We're not at the point where they think that's a fun thing. Mm -hmm. Does anybody else want to share on this subject? We have plenty more uh, questions, so there will be plenty. Yeah. I just make a comment about the USDA, uh, just real briefly, so people know how the zoos work, uh, coming from that experience. We used to complain a lot, a lot, a lot, because, you know, just not from the elephants, but you could hear what was going on with other animals. And Frank Enders was the USDA representative in San Diego at the time. And he was, for once, he was honest. He was a big, huge guy. It just looked like, just like big, huge Santa Claus. And we caught him off guard one day, and we said, why the hell don't you listen to us? You could, actually, one time he was there, and we could hear them beating Cindy. You could hear her howling through the whole area. He said, I've been ordered by my bosses to give the Zoological Society of San Diego anywhere from two to three weeks notice before I come in on any complaint, no matter what it is, so they can clean their act up so when I come in so I can't find something even though he was a vet. And I had a friend of mine who was down at the San Diego Zoo and I said, is that true? And she said, absolutely right. And so we tried one time to go to the Humane Society of San Diego 
And we had pictures and documentation of other stuff, and she said the exact same thing. Now, this is the Humane Society of San Diego. Said, we've been ordered by our bosses, if any complaint comes in from the Zoological Society, you throw it in the circular file, and everybody knows what that is. Just throw it in the garbage. That's the power, at least in San Diego, of the Zoological Society. So any complaints to USDA and anything Humane Society, and I found it in Chicago, too. Very rarely would they listen to you because of the power of the people that run those zoos. So that's from a zoo perspective. So, just, just thanks. One, one thing briefly on, you know, if you are calling and trying to get venues shut down, if there is a traveling circus and you find out that an elephant is, or any exotic is coming to your town, be pragmatic. Um, you check your emotions at the door. You can cry and punch a pillow later. But know who, you're, know who you're talking to. What's important to these city officials is public safety. Um, you know, we all know what elephant riding is about. We know that it's mean. They don't know that. Um, they're concerned with the, the safety of their citizens. So you kind of know your audience, know what, you're want to, what message do you want to get to them. Um, you, you don't want to come across as a crazy animal rights person and all, you know, riding an elephant is not illegal. That's the bottom line. Um, but they're certainly concerned about um, if they have an exhibitor there who doesn't have insurance, if they have an exhibitor there who has a history of um, maybe an elephant that possibly had caused an injury. Um, those are the types of things that you want to, want to communicate to um, these venues where these circuses are popping up. You know, th th they're going to be much more concerned with um, public safety than they are the welfare of the animal. That, that's, that's the reality of it. I would just uh, quickly add that if you're uh, protesting at a circus or protesting at an event where exotic animals are, it's always helpful to have someone go inside incognito and capture as much video as you can. You absolutely never know what you're going to get. We have uh, all investigations aren't undercover. Sometimes you can just be in the audience and you can catch an act go wrong, an animal get injured in the ring. You can. Um, if you watch the staging area right before the, the animal act is coming on, that's often a time when they're abusive to the animal to get them primed up and ready for the act. We've, we've captured, uh, just in, this, in the audience, we've captured um, elephant handlers shocking and, and uh, hooking elephants right before they go on stage. Sometimes even during a performance we've seen it and caught it on video. So um, it, it's always good to be shooting video. You never know what you're going to get. Anybody else, or we want to? Okay, uh, here's one. You all have so much precious wisdom and experience gained from many years working with and for elephants. What are you doing to mentor and educate young adults so that others can carry on your particular mission for elephants? I would add, not just young adults, especially young adults, but anybody. I'll get that one because I just got done talking to kids a little while ago. You'd be amazed at how smart kids are these days. You know, when I grew up, we had three channels on the TV, and that was it. We had Ozzie and Harriet. Come on, we all know what we're talking about. You know, Bozo the Clown, all the rest of that crap. These kids, when I went and spoke, they all had video cameras. They had technology. They had everything. And they know how to download stuff. They know how to pass it to their friends. And it goes instantaneously. It goes around the world. It just does. Could you imagine if I had had a video camera when I was working at Wild Animal Park? And we had other stuff. We didn't have any of that stuff. We had to get the word out by going and speaking. Now we don't have to leave our houses. Everything, what's going on right now, we're streaming everything live. That's how instantaneous. And if you go to the kids, they listen because they know the difference. Sometimes go to a zoo and don't say a word. And stand behind some of the kids. You know what they all say 90% of the time? They look so sad. They don't look right. It doesn't look right. It doesn't look good. And my big thing with the kids when I go talk to anybody in Chicago, we have a huge natural history museum. We have the aquarium. We have everything. And I tell the kids, go when you go to the aquarium and you see that dolphin show. And just raise your hand and they'll, all those trainers love to listen to kids. First thing out of your mouth, say to them or ask them, is that their food for the day? And then they may want to change it because that is their food for the day. If they don't entertain, they don't eat. And I don't know if anybody didn't know that. And all the dolphin shows, they don't entertain, they don't eat. And the other question I ask them is, what's the difference between the Natural History Museum and the zoo? Well, I don't know, Mr. Ryan, what do you think? I said, sometimes the animals in the zoo move. And then it registers in their head. And I go, you're right. I said, I don't know if anybody has been down to Chicago in that Jerusalem Museum. First thing you walk in are two African elephants. But sometimes 
you go to the zoo and neither one, they look just like them, they don't move. So if you can educate the kids, because us old geezers have tried and we can't change things right now. So get to the kids and the adults that run stuff will be afraid of the kids because the kids are going to grow up and they're the ones that are going to have the money. And they're the ones that are going to be the advertisers and they're the ones that are going to buy stuff in town. So get to them if you can. There's enough of them, some you're never going to get, but that's okay. Taking the high and the low and the diving score. You always get the middle of the bell curve if you can. Okay. Thanks, Ray. Thanks. Um, um, at PAUSE, we started actually kind of following up on what you just said, Ray. Um, uh, we started a program for college level students. I mean, we also do local outreach with you know, grammar schools and that, but we felt it was important to have an outreach program for what we called future opinion leaders. And like, so what we do is we have um, college professors can bring in a class, they can bring up to 25 people with them, uh, you know, students, other faculty. Um, we're going to be hosting our third one next weekend. And what we do is when we, we bring them to the sanctuary, and the first thing I say is that you're not here to see animals. You're here to hear, you're here to hear their stories stories and I tell them you know that our animals are not here to be on display they're not here to be looked at you know they've they've left those lives behind basically and they're fortunate enough to be at the sanctuary so and they do hear their stories and they also hear though about their natural lives I mean I won't go into everything but you know we have um, like I said it's about a four-hour program that we do on um, so they'll be learning about, like I said, natural histories, but versus, um, you know, animals' lives in captivity. And it's our, our bears, our big cats, and the elephants. So, and we're hoping, again, like I said, this is uh, focused on future opinion leaders, and hopefully these are people. And we've seen, actually, we're also doing um, a pre-post study with it as well. So we're going to be looking at whether or not people's attitudes and knowledge are changing before they come to the sanctuary versus after um, you know, participating in this program. So hopefully we're going to be, um, you know, as soon as we have a, you know, a few more classes come in, we'll be looking at that data as well. So. I was just going to say, um, on more of a grassroots level, um, I think it's really important in any kind of campaign you're running to get young people involved. Um, not necessarily children, but, but young, like college age, young 20s uh, people. And, you know, for me, as an, as an older person in my 50s, I, I had to learn all the new kind of social media stuff, which was huge for me. But it's really important in your campaign to be able to get on Facebook. Those are the, that's how the young people are communicating with each other. And that's how we get, you know, a lot of people out to our rallies. That's how we get people to come and speak um, when we're in front of the city council, when we're at the neighborhood councils. And you really want to make sure young people are included. Um, they, they are the future. They are the people that need to carry on this work for us. And um, as for the, the children, um, as a teacher, I mean, that's a huge education component. And um, I work really hard just through my own school to try to bring in, um, actually, PETA came with Ellie the Elephant to our school. I brought, I brought Ellie the Elephant into our school. And just to bring programs, just to keep it in front of the kids, keep, keep talking about it. And every day in, in your classroom, if you're a teacher, it comes up, things, issues about animals come up every day in the classroom with my kids. And we actually, in, in our program, have a unit on the zoo, which, I've had to teach many times, and we always approach it in, let's really talk about the zoo. Let's talk about what, let's talk about it from the animal's perspective and turn it around. And kids need to learn that kind of thinking. They need to learn to question. They need to learn to be flexible. They need to learn not just to take that curriculum the way it's written and do exactly what they're told to do. We want to teach kids to be thinkers and to have opinions and to grow up and to be able to take a stand on these issues when they're older. So I question them and I push them and I get them to think about it from the animal's perspective. And when they really start to think about it, they start to understand, you know, they're not they're not happy. This isn't about us. This isn't about us getting to go in and look at an animal. This is about the animal. And they're an individual. They're a person. They have a life and they have their own agenda that they want to carry out. And it's not about us. And I really try to get my kids to, to look at it from that different perspective. I want to... Uh, Kirsten, can you also yeah. say, most of us probably know who Ellie the Elephant is, but for the folks on live stream, could you just oh. tell, because it's just wonderful. Ellie the Elephant is a, well, and correct me if I get anything wrong, <laughs> she's a fully animatronic, um, not quite life-size, but she's big, to the kids she's big, um, elephant that they wheel into the school, and she talks, and she's amazing, and the kids sit there absolutely spellbound. You don't need to see a real elephant if you have Ellie the elephant. I mean, she's incredible. And she talks to the kids about um, 
the experience of captive elephants and also the experience of elephants in the wild. And they, really, they show it, they have a whole video program that goes with it and they, you know, sh show the, the two different um, scenarios of what it's like in captivity and what it's like for an elephant living in the wild. And they really, it, and the kids really have like this personal experience with an elephant who's talking to them. And my students happen to also have um, disabilities. So they really needed, uh, they needed to touch her and they needed to get up close and they really needed to experience it and they let her they let them I, I didn't think they were going to let my kids do that and they did and it was my my kids were just in awe I mean it was just really an amazing experience for them and so thank you PETA <laughs> yeah that's a PETA effort and I, I want to also add when I when I've seen it uh, before they wheel Ellie in they ask the kids uh, they ask the kids, you know, who likes circuses, zoos, or whatever, and all the kids go, you know, like that. Then they wheel her in, they do the program, and then they ask the kids if they want to go, and they go, mm-mm. <laughs> and it's just, you know, it's just a matter of the kids knowing. They have a right to know, right to know. Yeah, Matt. Uh, I would just like to add that, um, well, Rescue and Freedom Project has a kids component, and I mentioned this in my talk, for really articulate young middle schoolers uh, made a presentation in Los Angeles this week to introduce a cruelty-free ordinance to make all the city products cruelty-free. And they did it on their own. They did all the research, they did the presentations, they did it much better than any adult would have done and I think the impact was bigger. And in the case of zoos and circuses, these kids are the stakeholders. This is for them. All this entertainment is for them and it's all based on lies. And when kids get up in front of city councils and they make that presentation and they articulate it, it resonates. It's like, oh, okay, the kids don't want this and this is what it's all for. So we've got to rethink this. And uh, when I was with Animal Defenders International, we saw this happening again and again. There was a, uh, a group of middle school students in Idaho that went town to town. They were passing ordinance after ordinance after ordinance um, in their community and they were doing it, they had a, an adult mentor, but they were doing it on their own and they got all these city councils to ban exotic animals in their, in circuses in their town. So they don't have to wait till they're adults, they can do it now and help us uh, make this happen. Anybody else before we move to the next question? Okay. Uh, so we hear about the worst in the in the we hear about the worst zoos in the U.S. Which zoos, if any, are less bad or better than most? Why wouldn't other zoos follow a better model if they have elephants? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, again, just to reiterate, I mean, there is no form of captivity that's acceptable for an elephant. And again, that's the importance of protecting elephants and protecting them, their habitats, protect them where they live. Um, that said, I would say in uh, the United States, as far as um, elephant programs, um, Oakland Zoo, um, Paws has had a long-term relationship with Oakland Zoo. And because they work really hard for their elephants, they were actually, I think early on, you know, it gave them their elephants more space. But quite honestly, I think, to me at least, it's they work really, really hard for their elephants. They go, you know, they work extended hours. They go out of their way to provide browse, you know, for their African elephants. And um, so we, we do respect their program. Also, I, you know, they were also trying to um, establish a facility that uh, would have been, you know, several thousand acres. Um, Unfortunately, they were going to breed elephants, which he didn't agree with, but otherwise it was not a bad idea to be able to, you know, for elephants that are already in captivity, to be able to give them more space, a more natural space, more complex, dynamic, changing space, um, you know, would have been a positive, of course, without the breeding. But um, I don't know, that's the only one that stands out to me, quite honestly. I mean, I think San Diego, they have really, you know, good veterinary program, and um, I, I, well, I don't... <laughs> Except they're doing something right now that um, they're actually, they've received a permit, you can kick in on this one, they've received a permit to import a captive born elephant from Australia. However, the elephant is not, and he's young, what, he's about nine years old on guard? Yeah, yeah. I think he's nine, yeah. And um, so uh, he's not going to San Diego though. He's going to be going to Zoo Miami. So for whatever reason, um, it was accepted. Fish and Wildlife um, is going to issue the permit, you know, and uh, even though, it, I mean, Zoo Miami should have applied for the permit, and plus there's a lot of 
I mean, I don't want to go on too long, but there, I mean, there was a lot that was wrong with the permit, too. I mean, claiming that he was going to be living with a herd and living, you know, what else are they saying there? Just here. Um, should, yeah. We can tag team on this one. <laughs> so in this particular case, um, San Diego Zoo has entered into... Rich, a, a little closer to the mic. San Diego Zoo has entered into a long-term agreement with, I believe it's Zoo's Melbourne. Um, it's a, Zoo's a zoo, Victoria. Zoo's Victoria. Yep. It's a zoo association in Australia. And the agreement says um, that the two, San Diego and this other entity, will collaborate to identify their um, elephants who are not needed in their SSP, and then they'll trade. And so this is the first that we know of, the first um, elephant who's going to be imported as a part of that deal. San Diego's acting as a broker. Um, it's not, as far as we can, t at least in this case, it's not getting an elephant. Um, it is just facilitating. Um, and talk about, if we're talking about the amount of money. Um, I think that in the, per the permit application, it actually showed that it was something like they were going to spend something like $100,000 just on the transport. And that's, you know, that's just the flight in. Um, and, you know, think about how far that could be going towards actual conservation. And the justification for these kinds of permits is conservation. Um, and I, I would encourage anybody who's really interested in, in um, combating zoo breeding, um, and more imports of elephants is to yes. watch the Federal Register closely. And these permit applications are typically um, available online at a website called regulations.gov. Mm -hmm. um, so in the Federal Register, they publish notice of a permit. And you have 30 days to comment, usually. Um, and all of that permit information is available online. And you get um, a lot of important information from that. So one example would be um, there was a copy of the AZA's, SSP's um, Asian elephant breeding plan in there, the whole thing. And it's, it says right there in, in the Zoo Association's own words that um, elephant breeding isn't sustainable. And so um, they're going to keep trying and keep trying and keep trying. Yeah, so outside of that, <laughs> um, but otherwise, I mean, I do have to say, though, San Diego has a, a, the very, their veterinary program is exemplary. Um, and also, I mean, I've met keepers from San Diego. They're very, very strong on protected contact and, you know, just positive reinforcement training with their elephants. And I respect that as well there. So I just want to be, be, to be fair about things, you know. All right, I got to say something. <laughs> I just have to. I just have to because I know more than... A lot of you know, because I still have friends that still work at the zoo, and I know people that left the zoo. So first things first, when we talk about exemplary care of elephants at the Wild Animal Park and the San Diego Zoological Society, okay, is when my Ellie's were shipped to Lincoln Park and they brought in the first Swazi animals from Africa, the guy that was brought in to take care of the elephants had never touched an elephant in his life. Okay, let's start there. I've been down to the zoo recently, a few years ago, and talked to the people. Most of them had never been around elephants before. They didn't know what the hell they were doing. So I want to tell you something. And maybe it's my paranoia growing up in Chicago and growing up in a state where four of the governors have gone to prison because of corruption. When you think they're doing something with a transport plane to bring in one elephant to do something, something else is going on. And I don't want to get you all paranoid, but something else is going on. There's not enough money in moving one elephant or two elephants. There just isn't. And I've already been to the Wild Animal Park, and the guy that was in charge of the elephants at the Wild Animal Park was recently kicked out and demoted after 30 years of working there. You want to hold? Here's why. Because he went to the higher-ups and he complained that the other keepers weren't listening to him and filling in holes when they got filled with water so the elephants wouldn't get salmonella. And they brought him down in front of the bosses and said, keep your mouth shut. You want to still work here? Now you're off the elephants after 30 years. So now you're going to work a string of elephants till you retire. So I'm sorry, those are the facts about the Zoological Society of San Diego. Sorry. Thanks, Ray. Uh, do you want to say something, Kirsten? Can I yeah, please. Really quick about the Los Angeles Zoo. Um, the Los Angeles Zoo is considered by the AZA to be one of their model, state of the art, top of the line elephant exhibits eject them. If we shut down that exhibit, they'll go right back to San Diego or to another zoo. 
Um, Shanzi was brought in because her longtime partner at Fresno Chaffee recently passed away, so she was alone there, so they had to move her. So they shipped her in to LA because AZA is completely focused on the Los Angeles Zoo right now, and they're fighting us tooth and nail, and they're doing everything they can. Uh, so they brought Shanzi in. Um, they they want to bring 11 elephants into that exhibit, by the way. That exhibit, that tiny exhibit, is built to hold 11 elephants. So they're bringing them in. From wherever they can get them, they're bringing them in, and they want to bring in breeding age. Um, so anyways, we don't have jurisdiction over Shanzi either, so she would be shipped out to another zoo. Um, we initially, what our push, when we first started lobbying the city council on the second reincarnation, that's, there's a lot of history to the Billy campaign, as Catherine can tell you. <laughs> a very, very years-long history. So this is kind of the second reincarnation, I just to make that clear. We had, we had big shoulders to stand on. So um, anyways, uh, when we first started this push, we wanted the city, we wanted the, the emotion to shut down the elephant exhibit, just shut it down. We just, we don't even need elephants in the zoo, let's shut it down. And uh, we had long discussions with the council member's office before this even, you know, became public. And what, from all of their, you know, the, the council members that we had working with us, from their research into what was going on politically in the city, they said that is just not going to happen right now. We will never get that through. We've got to start with something we can do. I think someone was talking about, you know, small steps, not perfection. Which for someone like me, you know, that, that was a hard pill to swallow. It was hard. And I resisted it for a long time. And I, they were right. They were right. And I, I, they, I know they did the right thing. But... Um, if, I mean, it would have been dead in the water if we had tried to shut down the whole thing. So, um, uh, did I answer your question? I'm sorry. I kind of went off on something else. Anyways, thank you. <laughs> I just want to add, too, there's other aspects to that motion as well, because it also would stop breeding at the yes. LA Zoo, which is hugely, hugely important. I think you know, if there's any other points that I would bring up, again, that I kind of missed in my presentation yesterday, it would be the importance of um, trying to stop breeding programs, which is really difficult because those babies bring in revenue. They bring in visitors. And uh, the other thing, of course, would be... Um, what, what I was saying, no breeding, and also um, to, oh, now I lost my train of thought. Uh, what's the other thing in the motion? So it would stop breeding? There's just two things. Really, it was just Billy and the breeding? I thought there yeah. was one more part to well, it. Well, the third part was to shut down the exhibit, but that didn't happen. Okay, part, okay, I was thinking there was one more part, but yeah. So, yeah, we want option number three, yeah. shut it all yeah. down. For those of you know, most of you know, but on live stream, the Oregon Zoo here, and I'm not an expert, many people in this room are, but they got, you know, like 50 some million in taxpayers' money to improve the elephant enclosure. And it's just, it's just a bigger sand lot with a lot of beautiful, you know, Pacific Northwest shrub, you know, landscape around it for the, it's great for the, for the tourists but it's not much different for the elephants. You know, we don't want better cages, right? Okay, uh, thank you guys. So how about this one? Does the involvement of public figures such as actors and musicians assist the cause of change for captive elephants? Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> I mean, if Closer, you, Rachel. Sure. So, I mean, public figures, particularly celebrities, um, they can be so helpful because if you go and look at their social media, they have thousands of followers. So that's a very, if you're able to get a celebrity um, to support your campaign, and that's not an easy thing to do um, because that involves developing relationships, um, finding the right issue for the right person because you know, everybody's got their pet issues. Um, but that is a way to get your message into celebrity press. So that's, you know, uh, newspapers like TMZ where you're not expecting there to see animal issues. That's a way to get your animal issue in front of that audience. Um, and then just social media is so powerful um, to, if you have a celebrity, just even retweet your organization's tweet. I mean, that is just a way to exponentially expand the reach of your message. So yeah, it's absolutely helpful. Anybody else? Like, we have many other questions. I, yeah. I, would, I would totally agree with that and just say if you're um, looking for the right celebrity, there's obviously the go-to celebrities you can Google and see who have spoken up on a certain issue, but also look in your own community if you're looking at your local zoo, are there any celebrities that are from your state or from your city or you know, somehow connected to your community that you could reach out to on an issue? 
Can someone tell me what our hard stop time is? Okay, we'll go until. <laughs> uh, is that a question? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'll just say with all the celebrities in Los Angeles, how is it that like Free Billy, I know that Cher and Lily Tomlin, how is it? Do you want to take that? Um, well, it gets you attention. It gets media attention for sure because well, there was that recent meeting uh, what Cher came out to and who came out? Who Lily else? Tomlin. Yeah, Lily yeah. Tomlin. Right. Of course, um, Lily's been fantastic on Elephant Issues. She's amazing. Was there, but he was on the he's on the other side. Yeah, he's. But but I would say. Um, I don't, you know, I, I don't know. Sometimes it depends. There's like some municipalities you can go into where they're a little more impressed by a celebrity. And I think in LA, quite honestly, you know, it'll draw the media yeah. attention. But after that, it's kind of, yeah, I don't think it affects the council members quite as much. No, yeah. no, it doesn't. Yeah. And I think, I think your question was, how can the zoo still be open, right? But there's huge support for the zoo in Los Angeles, even included among the celebrities. Um, Betty White, Huge zoo supporter. Huge. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Don't think she's an animal person. No, she comes, she's, she is at, she comes to the LA Zoo and does promotion for them all the time. Yeah. She loves the zoo. She wants to be able to go and see all her little animals that she loves in the zoo. Um, Slash from Guns N' Roses comes out and testifies for the zoo at city council meetings. Um, it's, it, Los Angeles feels very strongly about their zoo, and it's um, it's it's a real it's a real battle. I mean, even just going out to neighborhood council meetings, we our city's divided into about 100 boroughs, with, and each one has a neighborhood council that's under the city council. And we go out and testify over and over again. And the zoo comes out, and they bring all these people out, and they parade all these people in to give public comment supporting the zoo from little children to grandmothers. And it's all about, we want our zoo. We want to go to the zoo. We want to see the animals. And that's why it stays open. Though I will say, just to add something, I mean, I think because of the work that's been done there for so many years about elephants in Los Angeles, I think, let's put it this way, I mean, having Slash as one of their celebrities is yeah. like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they haven't really gotten great celebrities, but, no. and Betty White's been with them forever. In fact, she used to walk with the elephant Gita, and Gita had like, Oh, horrific foot problems, you know, foot rot and, and arthritis, and yet, and, and they'd be walking, Gita, um, before the zoo was open, they'd be walking her with a bull hook, and Betty White would walk with her, and that was one of her favorite things to do, so, just throw that out there. Um, so, here's a question I'm very interested in, I didn't ask it, but uh, hopefully some people here know about it. Um, please discuss the King Amendment. Does anybody here have any knowledge of it? Does anybody, uh, I, okay, so very quickly, the, yeah, and then I want you to really, uh, it's, uh, it's an amendment that could potentially wipe out many of the, like the fur ban in San Francisco, many of the animal bills that have been passed, it could potentially, I think, not on a national level, wipe them out or, so go, uh, I can't remember your name, I remember you, what is it? Tira. Tira, yeah. It's a weird bill. Here, why don't you come up here, because I want the live stream to hear it. Okay, it's a, it's a weird bill, and correct me, there's, there's a room full of lawyers, so if I'm missing something, let me know. But there is an amendment by a Republican senator from, I believe, Iowa, called the King Amendment. And it's a line item, or a paragraph, an amendment to the Farm Bill. The Farm Bill has been going through process in the federal government for years, as I understand it, two, three years. And so everybody wants to get this flippin' farm bill signed and off their desk. Well, they snuck in this amendment, and what it is is a massive case of federal overreach. And the rules state that the federal government, in the rule, it, it predominantly relates to animals, agriculture, chickens, and things like that. But it could potentially be read to affect the entire USDA, that the federal government has the ability to go into a state where they feel that the laws are unfair to commerce and essentially nullify any state-based law related to animal welfare, OK? This is a very, it's just come out. And it's, if you look at it, you want to know who's fighting it? Big agriculture. Because it impacts, 
pesticides and people who use pesticides and moving. The idea is it impacts commerce. If, if California does a battery issue on chickens or they pass an exotic animal ban in Florida, and it, it's also some type of horse gelding thing with racing. Oh, so, so, yeah, that, I don't know you want to know what that is. That's nasty. But uh, so it affects all these things. And if a state says that and another state wants to have commerce with this state and move their stuff around, even though Iowa has battery cages and Iowa has, it affects puppy mills. If they have puppy mills in Pennsylvania and, and California passes an anti-puppy mill, then it will impact the shipment of puppies. So this is this crazy. It's like, a, it's like those computer viruses that kind of sit there and nobody knows about, and then they just sneak through. And I don't know that it relates specifically at this point to elephants, but it's something that we all need to be aware about. And it's going before the House this week or next week. So please investigate this on your level and see, because it has the potential, if it sets this precedence, to, uh, to allow f massive federal overreach into community-based and state, talk about states' rights. It, it's anti-states' rights with regards to animal issues. So just be aware of it. And yes, ma'am, please talk. I just want to add something very briefly. For those participants learning more, Harvard's Animal Law Policy Program has posted online a detailed analysis of the Animal Law Policy Program. And it's a Delcy, can you repeat yeah. that? So Where Delcy you? said that uh, Harvard, did you say Harvard? Harvard's Animal Law Policy Program has extensive information about it. I know that Direct, direct Action Everywhere on their website does, and I, I would recommend Google it and learn a little bit about it and then call your representatives immediately. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot, Delcy. Okay, uh, probably the last question. Uh, are the three... Uh, sanctuaries in the U.S. sufficient to provide space for captive elephants who hopefully might find their way to sanctuaries? I hope not. <laughs> I, I, I hope we can fill them all up and we're going to have to open some more. I mean, that's why we're here, right? I, I right, can't so speak to... So we have Paws, Elephant, Tennessee Elephant, and then Carol Buckley's? And You're talking about them all at once? <laughs> uh, I don't know. They're just asking. They're saying three. Are, the, are, the, are they enough for the, all the elephants? Well, all at once, financially, oh. it would be extremely difficult. <laughs> I think even, you know, for all three sanctuaries, but... Um, that would be a good problem. I think, yeah, yeah, it would actually, yeah, be an interesting problem to have, but, you know, I don't think that's realistic. However, I think, um, we'll, uh, well, I mean, I can't speak for the elephant sanctuary in Tennessee, but we certainly have more space. It's always a matter of funding. I mean, Carol could tell you that. I mean, it's, right? <laughs> it's always like a matter of funding, so... Is there approximately 300... 340 captives in the U.S. in the U.S. right now. So. More than that, if you're talking about zoos and circuses. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we are. Um, the Carrillo Center is working to open the All Bull Elephant Sanctuary, which also will be located down in the um, south eastern part of the United States um, to open up more space, especially for bulls who do require more space. Um, there are almost a hundred bulls held captive in North America suffering in zoos and circuses and um, to take some of the pressure off of the other sanctuaries, um, we do need to open up more space. All right. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks. Uh, last thing, don't forget that we're live streaming Jane Velez Mitchell, Jane Unchained. Uh, we're live streaming, so you go, if you go to her uh, page.